Evening and welcome. This is the first show I've done since I became a press millionaire, which is different to being a real millionaire. In future, to live up to my press cuttings, I'm only going to interview people who are as rich as I am. Therefore, my guests tonight are Alan Bond, Prince Rainier, and my agent. <laughs> the, the nice thing about being called a millionaire is that, that once the rumour's floated, everybody believes it. I mean, you remain as you were, namely neck deep in financial distress, but people refuse to believe it. They change. For instance, as soon as I was befriended by Mr. Rupert Murdoch, a fond memory, and the news got out, strange things happened. Take my house as an example. In the past, if it merited a mention in the press at all, it was merely described as the place in which I lived. It's now become a $500,000 riverside mansion or a millionaire's luxury abode in the lush Thames Valley. <laughs> the milkman calls me sir for the first time. The wife genuflected every time I passed her. And she got quite giddy at the thought of sleeping with a millionaire for the first time. <laughs> and then the day after the news broke, I was travelling down by a sleeper from Scotland to London. And at the end of the journey, I, I wanted to give the attendant a tip. I mean, the fact is, you've got to give the attendant a tip if you want to get off the train. <laughs> now, I found I'd only got a £20 note in my pocket, and that seemed excessive, even for a, an alleged millionaire. I explained my problem to the attendant. I'm sorry, I said, but I can't tip you because I've only got a 20 quid note on me. And he smiled understandingly. That's all right, sir. He said, it's not worth people like you carrying any less, is it? <laughs> well, anyway, that's all by way of a preamble to this, the first show of my new series. And I've got some very special guests. There's an old mate of mine from England, one of the best actors in the business, who created, along with Johnny Spate, one of the great and lasting television characters, Horrible Alf Garnet. He is, of course, Warren Mitchell. Another of my guests also created a magnificent television monster, a journalist of appalling ignorance and monumental lack of taste. He was the man who asked my favourite television question of all time when he inquired of Paul McCartney what it was like being married to a Jap. Now, he is Norm Norman Gunsty, and, and he will... I know, it's a marvellous question. I wish I had it. And he'll appear on the show, but not before I talk to his creator, Gary MacDonald. And then there's the singer, who I rate simply as the best in the business, and he's Jack Jones, and he'll be singing a couple of numbers and talking to me later in the programme. We'll see you after the break, when I'll be talking first to Gary MacDonald. <laughs> Now, television, like movies, is about moments. You never remember a whole show, but you'll never forget the odd occasion when something rare happens. One of my favourite moments occurred watching BBC a few years ago and seeing Malcolm Muggeridge, the most elegant stylist in the business, looking agape and aghast at the efforts of an Australian journalist called Norman Gunston to interview him. After a while, Mr Muggeridge told Mr Gunston that of the two people in the studio, one was most certainly mad and, said Mr Muggeridge, he himself was perfectly sane. The monster confronting him was one of the funniest grotesques ever created on television. In America, as in Britain, Norman left a clutch of open-mouthed stars, not quite certain what had happened. In Australia, as one columnist noted, he split the nation down the middle. Gunston is the creation of one of Australia's best comedy actors, someone who's worked on stage, television and films. Ladies and gentlemen, Gary MacDonald. <laughs> I said there, one of my favourite <coughs> monsters, Norman Gunston. How, in fact, did he happen? What was the start, the creating point of him? Um, well, funnily enough, I mean, uh, it goes back a long way, but I did a tour with uh, David Frost, and um, I hadn't done much review then, I don't think. No, I hadn't. I'd done one review, I think. And uh, David Frost uh, was doing this material. Well, he'd been doing it for about ten years, and he still is doing it. And... Um, <laughs> He actually did it on the Sammies. It was funny hearing all those Karma Sutra jokes that had absolutely nothing to do with peer awards for Australian television. Anyway, that's by the by. Um, I did this tour with David Frost, and we were all very inexperienced. I remember every morning on that tour, when we toured all around Australia, every morning he'd greet us with, Hello, Gary! And shake hands with me like he'd never met me before. And he probably had forgotten that he had met me, you know. <laughs> uh, anyway, on this tour we went everywhere. And uh, we... I think we were travelling from Perth to Adelaide and they'd asked us to wait in, the, in the, the guest lounge there. And they eventually came in and said, no, look, the plane's ready now. They didn't want us to sort of hang around. So we had to go up the back stairs of the plane. 
we, we got up on the plane and we had boarding passes and they showed the boarding. Neil Shand, who you probably know, mm -hmm. is David's uh, editor writer. and writer. And he showed the boarding passes and we wandered down to our seats. And when we got down to, <laughs> to our seats, the other hostess said, can I see your boarding pass, please? And um, uh, David Frost said, oh, Neil. And uh, Neil said, um, oh, yes, oh. We had coats and everything. He said, oh, look, these are the seats uh, 4A and 4C. I don't know where I've put them. I've showed them to the girl up back. I don't care who you showed them to. And he <laughs> said, but, but I showed them to her. And he said, I don't care who you showed them to. I am in charge of the section, the first class section of the cabin. I want to see your, your boarding passes, please. You got on the plane late. You knocked an old woman down the back there and made her cry. <laughs> and now you won't show me your boarding pass. And oh, so David, you know, eventually they found it. And David Frost is sitting there. And they had a big interview coming up. With um, uh, with Gough Whitlam and um, and uh, ears and bald head, uh, Billy McMahon, <laughs> and, uh, and he had uh, he uh, he had a lot of research to do on the plane. He carries a lot of newspapers with him, you know, <laughs> used to have around, obviously. And he was sitting there clipping out every, anything he saw on either of these gentlemen and putting it was a fairly empty plane, putting the uh, spent newspapers on the seat opposite. And they built up and built up, and eventually they slid into the aisle. And this airline has just come down and said, you going to pick that up? <laughs> Are you going to pick that up? He said, you're making that mess? He said, that's your job. You came on this plane, you came on late, you knocked a woman over down the back and made a call. <laughs> so anyway, David asked her, her name. And when we reached Adelaide, it was Perth to Adelaide, when we reached Adelaide, he rang up and he asked uh, his, uh, his promoter here to report her. And he said her name, and I said to him, no, 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 it was Norma Gunston. And I was actually wrong, it wasn't Norma Gunston, it was very similar. And, the, and that's where Norman actually came from. I mean, I take great pleasure in telling that story because those girls were on strike last week and I lost thousands of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> it came from a nasty air hostess, the name itself. But we, what are we seeing? A very eccentric air hostess, very eccentric. actually, yes. She's famous. All, I have hosties all the time. I've actually met her again on the plane. She's actually sat next to me and said, excuse me, I don't know where you know me, but I've got a name very much like yours. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, I know you, I know you. She sounds like she belongs to Faulty Towers. Yeah, she is, she's that sort of version. Yeah. When she was, she was, I said, I believe you were sort of um, working as a hostess like for seven months of your pregnancy. She said, oh, yes, it was amazing. I used to go up to passengers and say, yeah, coffee to your milk. <laughs> <laughs> she, was an she was an interesting woman. If she's, watch if she's watching the show, we'd love her as a guest. <laughs> <laughs> What about, I mean, you've, um, as, as somebody who earns a living out of interviewing, it seems to me that Norman Gunston, I mean, he trod where, where in, angels fear to tread. I mean, you've interviewed some of the most uh, difficult people. Nuraev, for instance. I mean, I lost about seven pounds in weight interviewing Nuraev. I mean, all I got was yes and no, mm. and this went on for about half an hour. Mm. How did you cope with him? Well, the, the thing with Nuraev was that um, he was playing the Colosseum and he was doing about... Uh, three ballets a week, which is unheard of. I mean, that's really taxing on the body. And uh, he had said to us, or his agent or whoever had said to us, yes, he will do it before he goes to his dressing room. So, you know, get your cameras and go upstairs to the green room. Now, uh, John Eastway, the producer of the program, thought, wait a minute, wait a minute, you know. This guy could just change his mind. Now, you know, in theatre, you have a half-hour call, so you've got to be in your dressing room by, say, 7.30 for an 8 o'clock show. So we thought, right, we set up in his dressing room. We came in, the guy at the door said, um, watch out, watch out if he comes in with his uh, jacket slung over his right shoulder. It means he's in a real foul mood. So we thought, oh, yeah, OK, OK. So we went into his dressing room, we set up, and it was such a cramped dressing room. We worked out that we couldn't do reverses with the cameras. You know, one camera's got to shoot there and one camera's got to shoot there. But we can only have both cameras that way, which is ridiculous. It means I have to talk to him like that all the time, which is very difficult. So what we did, I was going to look in the mirror. And we were going to shoot me in the mirror. And always I'd be talking to him like, hello, Michael, it's very, you know, over there. <laughs> But it didn't work. He came in at 7.30 with his jacket over his right shoulder. <laughs> and um, a gentleman in tow in dinner suit and dark glasses. And he went, what? You know, what is this? What? And all this sort of business. So we said, oh, it's the interview. Oh, I see. Because obviously, you know, he wasn't going to bother doing the interview. He just turned up at the half-hour call. So he had to do the interview. We were there. Uh, it, we, he said, a camera, camera, you have camera? And I said, oh, yeah, I'm a big star, you know. <laughs> and he said, this, what is this, what is this? And I said to him, I said to him, oh, you know, I'm a bleeder like the Russian royal family. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so, we started, 
you know, there's no falling out of character. One short there, you know. You know, you know pity we weren't filming then. Anyway, we started, and he just went like, "What is this? What is this all about? What is this?" And of course, I forgot to look at the guy talking. To him. <laughs> I was just, we had to flip the film. We had to reverse my film, which, you know, that's why I look fairly grainy. Um, it was amazing, you know, uh, you, you, you know, they say that you shouldn't be doing so many ballets a week. Who, who says this? Who says this? Oh, I, 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 you know, <laughs> Is it on your bit of paper? I, 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 it was amazing. It took me ten minutes to work out these questions, Mr. Nureyev. Cut it down to five! <laughs> so eventually I finished and he said, Interview over! <laughs> I said, I said to him, well, that's great, you know, go low, you really treated me like that. How about sh shaking, shaking hands, let's make up and be good friends, eh? What do you reckon? What do you reckon? <laughs> anyway, uh, oh, like, you know. But it was a good interview, it was a terrific interview. But I just at that moment, the light fell. We had lights and it fell on his young, uh, ma the young man that was with him. Constant head. companion. Great, yeah, his constant yeah. companion. <laughs> <laughs> Flatmate. <laughs> <laughs> his head it was just oh cry <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just I I tailed it out of that dress <laughs> I ran so far <laughs> I hid in the car out <laughs> <laughs> and, and he said to John Eastway what is this and John Eastway said he's Australian it's number one interviewer <laughs> and he said oh yes Australia <laughs> What about, what about Norma's encounters with women? Because <laughs> you got rather embarrassed once, didn't you, about... Well, women are always very good with Norma. <laughs> I mean, uh, Norman, the, the, the balance with women is always very good, you know. And uh, especially if you pick a, a fairly attractive young woman. I mean, there's been some very uh, eccentric sort of characters. I mean, often you think, um, like, say, Zsa Zsa Gabor. I mean, it's like, you know, how Jenny Little people say she's not like, like that off screen, but she no, is, of course. No, no. Well, Zsa Zsa Gabor is too. And she... Um, she was terrific because, um, I mean, Norman, of course, was frightened to go in there, you know, not being married and all that, he mightn't get out. But <laughs> the camera kept breaking down all the way through Zsa Zsa, and um, she kept, on, as it broke down, she went, oh, please, please, a very similar accent to Nureyev. And she said, <laughs> please, <laughs> man of many voices, please, uh, please, please, that noise, I cannot concentrate with that noise, please, what is wrong? She said, oh, and then she go, oh, please, we must, we must mention, we must mention when the camera starts again, I am an honorary director of the SPCA, because I love animals, I love animals. Um, and I said, all right, uh, there were dogs everywhere, you know, and uh, <laughs> some of them obviously, you know, in the camera. And she said, um, uh, I said to her, well, you know, you want me to bring up what dogs or what, oh, you know, yes, anything like that, darling, because I must give them as much publicity as possible, the SPCA. And I said, all right, camera started and made a noise again. Oh, no, I cannot concentrate, darling. As it's being fixed again, she said, Anyone here been to, um, the, to the Arctic region? Anyone been there? I've just been there. Boy, is it this beautiful. I could live there. It is wonderful. Sha Sha Gabor in Alaska. <laughs> right. I said, it is a wonderful place. She said, you know what? They, when I was performing for them, they brought me a baby seal skin jacket. They said, Miss Gabor, this is for you. And I said to her, well, Miss Gabor, you, you, know where, you, know, you know how they... Please don't tell me how they do it. It is terrible. I said to them, you cannot give me this. I'm an honorary director of the SPCA, and this is cruel what they do here. I cannot have that, please. So, you know, anyway, we went on filming. At the end of the interview, as we were about to leave, she said to me, uh, wait, 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 everyone, wait. I must show you this beautiful jacket that my husband has given to me. Isn't it wonderful? Made from 11 different animals. <laughs> And bits of everything, I'll leopard, like. cheetah, everything. What, what, what part of, of Gunston is, is you, Guy MacDonald? The, the, uh, the, I'd say the nervous uh, part with women. With women? Mm. Were well, you always nervous with women? Always, really? always. And uh, when Karen Black said to me at the end of uh, her interview, uh, kiss me, honey. I mean, you can just see the facade absolutely drop. <laughs> there's a sort of 50-50 uh, thing there, like, why not? And there's also, you know, I mean, like, I just sort of didn't know what to do. I sort of went to pieces a bit and blew her a kiss, Did you which she caught. <laughs> Did you go through an awkward adolescence, then, finding out about girls? Yes, I suppose so. Um, I always swore that I'd never send my son to uh, an all-male school because um, I only had a, a, an elder brother and my sister was nine and a half years younger than me. So I didn't, I just felt very uncomfortable with women. Uh, my son is now going to all male school, but <laughs> <clears throat> well, I did the right thing. I made sure that he had a sister that was only a couple of years younger than him. <laughs> um, the, uh, 
It was always very awkward. It's a funny thing about, uh, you know, the sexual revolution, of course, happened while we were, we were at school, and uh, they did all this, I mean, amazing sex talks they give you. It's just, uh, it's endless, and it's so, uh, it's, it's so academic. It's almost like you come out with a degree. Well, you know, as it turned out, not a degree, more an honorary doctorate, you know. <laughs> um, the apprenticeship part of it was sort of negligible. I just um, was very funny about women for a long time, and I was actually amazed, that, uh, you know, when I actually married a... Uh, a, a wonderful woman, also a very attractive woman. But I was very lucky she got a bit tiddly on the opening night of a play we were doing down in Hobart. <laughs> but, how did, again. but how did this, but how did this, this, this shy uh, creature ever have an ambition to go on stage? Because, I mean... Oh, well, that's only with, with women. Well, I thought I'd meet women. I thought I'd be in like ah, Flynn. That, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And possibly live a little longer, you know. And uh, um, I... That was one of... I mean, it's, it's basically why... But you notice I'm not wearing my wedding ring. I'm on tour at the moment. <laughs> no, actually, no, I forgot to say... Because I can't wear it because Norman doesn't wear a wedding ring on stage. Obviously, he's not married, except to his career. But um, I, I gave it to my uh, tour manager to wear, and he's wondering why he's not doing too well. <laughs> um, what did you ask me? I asked... <laughs> I asked you why, in fact, this shy creature decided to go on stage. Yeah, well, that was basically the reason. I mean, I was also in a band for a little while, and basically it was like, because uh, sort of women look up to, to um, you know, yes. to you. But, of course, I chose the wrong. I mean, women do not last after grotesques, as you called me before I came on. <laughs> no, I call the character grotesque, <laughs> oh, which it you. is. I mean, yeah. along with Alf Gunn, it's one of the great grotesques, isn't it, of, of, of television? It's fairly grotesque, yeah. But what... It, it, what didn't, it, didn't, it didn't work. I mean, the first, uh, first two years at NIDA were, were... Well, the first year, I mean, I was just uh, totally... Uh, that was all I was preoccupied with, uh, you know, losing my virginity. How did we get onto this tacky subject? <laughs> But I, I'd always wanted to be a comedian. I mean, there's pictures of me at, uh, at home as a kid, you know, pulling faces and uh, to the camera, and I, I haven't changed. No. And um, I decided to go to uh, to NIDA. It seemed it was the only way I knew of getting into show business. I actually went and did an, uh, an interview with uh, Hayes Gordon from the Ensemble, but I was a bit turned off with that because he had two Cocker Spaniels in his office that broke wind through the whole interview. <laughs> and I thought, the Ensemble is not for me. And I didn't really know much about that you know, drama school, but I went to NIDA and um, my grandmother thought, they told everyone that I was going to Von NIDA's. <laughs> to be a golf pro. Yeah, I think she, yeah, I think she thought I was a golf pro. My brother was a dentist, I suppose she thought he went to NIDA's, you know. <laughs> All right then, but we'll continue this discussion, this fascinating life of Guy MacDonald uh, in a moment. We'll be back in a moment with Guy MacDonald. We'll take a break now. See you in a moment. Welcome back. Still to come on the show, Warren Mitchell and Jack Jones, but first a bit more chat with Gary MacDonald. Can I... Can, uh, just one thing I forgot... Yeah. Uh, sorry. But yeah. one thing I forgot to tell you, that when I interviewed Ken Russell, I won't go into what happened with Ken Russell, he lost his temper with me from the first Well, he's word. notoriously yeah. difficult to interview. But, you see, I had no terms of reference in England, and when he asked what I was like, I said I was a sort of Australia's answer to Michael Parkinson. So. <laughs> and then, yeah, and yeah. I didn't realise how correct I was. No, yeah. <laughs> Went berserk. Michael Parkinson would never ask a question like that, you know. <laughs> he walked off with it. Oh, yes, he stormed yeah. out. What, what was the daftest question you've asked anybody? I mean, it was you asked McCartney that, that Jap question. I didn't say Jap. Wasn't I that? said to, no, McCartney, Linda McCartney kept interrupting all the time. And in the end, I turned around and said, It's funny, you know, you don't look Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> But she still didn't know. She still didn't. She went like she went and did you know things with her oh, eyes. I mean, she yeah. sort of just like and he's going <laughs> like shut up. What about the, the the creation of that character? Do you think it's in, in a way held you back as a as an actor? No, no. You know, one of the biggest influences on my career, apart from uh, say uh, Gordon Chater um, and um, characters like you know, I've always admired Peter Sellers and people like that. But Gordon was really good to my career. Um, uh, there's not many people in the Australian show business that do that. It's also, you know, us against them all the time. And, and um, another, another influence, funnily enough, is Kamal. Um, Kamal? The, yes. Uh, <laughs> singing. <laughs> no. <laughs> Kamal said at the very first Sammy Awards that a lot of people don't realise that, you know, show business is that. It's business. And it is. It's a career. And I'm not in it to prove anything to my peers, anything to TV critics, anything to theatre critics. I am, you know, I am there to entertain an audience. And um, that's what... It, and, and not, not 
not purely to entertain, I'm also, it's a career. I mean, right. I have a life, I have a family, and someone else has a job, they're an electrician, and they don't say, oh, gee, I've sold so many of these PowerPoints, I'm not going to do another one, you know? Yeah. It's, a, it's, <laughs> right, right, it's, 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 it's a career. And, uh, and I think what he said is, is correct. And what happens in this business, and you s I've seen it a lot now with my contemporaries, people like John Derham, they suddenly, right, bang, just take the career in their own hands, uh, which, which, which I do, you know, I've done, because otherwise you're at the mercy. And, you know, when they say things like, well, it's about time you did something else, and you say, all right, okay, I rang up a few people, I said, right, I'm available, I'd love to have a part in your mini-series, I said to a chap I like very much. He gave me a part, and he said, you know, oh, we want people like you, we want people like you and Graham Kennedy, and, you know, a straight part, though, and, and I said, of course, fantastic. I had two sentences, not two, you know, speeches, two sentences spread over two hour-long episodes. Mm. One was, ah, it's hot today, or something, and I... It, you know, and that sort of thing, you know, fourth leads in an uh, in in obscure Shakespearean play, the Sydney Theatre Company. Mm. And you, so you just realise, you know, you'll be at the mercy. What they call serious acting is playing a sort of child molester rapist, uh, you know, on a <laughs> cop shop. Yeah. One episode, you know. Right. And uh, that's not what it's all about. That's not what show business is all about. Well, long may Norman Gunston go on anyway. I hope so. I mean, I'm in, I enjoy it very much. The trouble, you've had this trouble too. You, the, the people misquote all the time in Adelaide. It's had that I was tired playing. I said to the chap, I get uh, tired of playing Norman Gunston. I said to him, I get tired. When I'm on tour, I get tired doing the publicity. So they say, Nora Garrett, I'm tired of playing Norman Gunston. Mm -hmm. Not quite the same yeah. thing. I mean, I've still got, I look, the, Oh, you haven't got Go time. No, yes, yes, yes. I still get some terrific fan mail. I've just been North Queensland. This is terrific. Gary McDonald, you would be one of the greatest apes ever to antagonise an intelligent public audience. <laughs> According to a well-known Southern critic, you were disgraced to TV audiences and had been sacked from TV programs and would never appear again. You did to our sorrow. And I consider that you should be lined up with a religious fanatic, Ayatollah, and you know what? <laughs> to think that you could be allowed to inflict your drivel on Good Friday as a abhorrent. And I agree with Bishop Faulkner in his remarks in TDB, April the 16th, 1981. Hope you don't get any idiots to watch your idiot antics. <laughs> He's a journalist from the Women's Weekly TV magazine. <laughs> <laughs> nice to know you got fans in the It is, yeah, it is. Encouraging. Well, what you're going to do now is show us another aspect of your talent, which is uh, music. I mean, Norman plays Balmonica very badly on occasion. Well, I, 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 I could do the same myself, I probably will. You play it very well, indeed. Well, I, I used to be in a band. That's I'd right. pick it up once a year. I'm making terrible excuses now, so that if I make any bum notes, I only picked up the tune just about an hour ago, you and I've got terrible dryness of the mouth. And... <laughs> we'll see. Okay. Can I take the water? You can take the water. I'll need it. Go, McDonald. Thank you. Along with Johnny Spate, my next guest tonight created a character who will go down in the English language as the voice of bigotry. Alf Garnett's more than a magnificent theatrical creation. He's now a symbol of everything loud-mouthed, obnoxious, self-opinionated and generally appalling. The actor who played the part has recently displayed his talents in a manner which most earned him recognition as one of the world's leading actors. In recent years, he's played King Lear, Willie Loman in Death of a Salesman, a performance which won him the Best Actor Award in Britain, Davis in Harold Pinter's The Caretaker, and Shylock in the BBC's production of The Merchant of Venice. 
He's about to open in Sydney in Ronald Howard's The Dresser, which won the Best Play Award in Britain last year. Ladies and gentlemen, Warren Mitchell. said this new part you're doing now, is there a sort of technique you have for getting into a part? Guinness says that when he gets the walk right, he's got the character. Do you have any similar kind of technique? Yeah, get the wig and the trousers right. I mean, <laughs> is that right? Well, I mean, I don't play outfits. The trousers and the glasses play out. Yeah. I've got a super wig. Have you? And um, I'm playing a, quite a camp character. Gordon Chater said it wouldn't do to talk about it because it, people stay away in their thousands, but I don't think it's true. <laughs> And I suppose my technique of study, well, I've flown Qantas so many times now. I'm just trying to <laughs> watch them mincing up and down the aisles, you know. <clears throat> but is it based, this character, on. Uh, I mean, you've been in the theatre for a long, long time now. Is it based Not on. Not that long. Well, you have. Well, a younger character, actually. I... <laughs> Don't look all that old. I... <clears throat> no, you, you brush it well. Yeah. <clears throat> I've never worn a suit before on television. I thought this was Michael's first, you know. They've got to make a showing, keep the palms got to stick together, you know. That's right. <laughs> what are you doing over here, Michael? Can't you get a job back home or something? <laughs> <laughs> got enough interview show. We've got Mike Walsh. I mean, what do we need you over here for? You know? But tell me about, about this play, then, about the, the character you, you play. Is it based on any of your dressers, the people who've dressed you? I've had uh, several dressers, um, and there was one, Albert, I mean, an extraordinary little man, who... Um, I mean, his, his whole, whole life was service, I mean, to serve. And he, if, if he couldn't run errands for me, he wasn't happy. Um, they usually, most dressers have been in the theatre, dancers or singers, not very good ones, you know. And the, in fact, Norman, the character I play, has been a sort of understudy, never actually performed. I'm very nervous as being your first uh, hey. uh, dry mouth. It's uh -huh. an extraordinary thing, I mean, it happens. I, Gary was worried about his... Uh, well, he did all right. He did marvellously. <coughs> <That's right. And, laughs> The terrors. I, I, I remember actually Hancock, I mean, bless him, he used to get absolutely petrified, you know, because it was live in those days. Well, this is virtually live. I mean, I suppose if I said, if I dropped the word, you could snip it out, but uh, <laughs> um, it is virtually live. But you worked um, with Hancock a lot, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, he, he gave me... I, I don't agree with Gary, actually. I have found the very reverse. I have found uh, people in this profession to be comradely and very helpful and very little bitchiness and very little... Uh, I mean, an enormous amount of help I've had from big people. And uh, Hancock was the first, and I, I, I had a tiny part. Han well, Hancock, it was live. I mean, and, and Tony used to get in the most terrible state just before transmission. You know, he'd be walking around saying, oh, God, why do we do it? Why do we? I mean, dustmen don't get nervous, do they? For that. <laughs> and and I, I, I get sort of big, and I tell jokes and clown, or I said, here, Tony, have you heard? Not now, not now. He said, not now. Not, wait, wait, wait. And we went on to do the show. I had a time, I was this mad uh, continental, you know, for years I didn't, pl I never played an Englishman, you know. I mean, Alf was my first Englishman virtually. And, and when you think of it, it's a strange choice of the typical Eng English um, bastard because he's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm from Russian grandmother, I'm Jewish, and um, you, when you look at me, I mean, I could play Mikoyan or even <laughs> Grivas, but I mean, to play a typical Englishman, I don't think I look anything like an Englishman. And anyway, I was playing this uh, one of my uh, continental parts, and, and I had one line, and then Tony said his next line. I said, but, and his next line was a feed for my only joke. And he dried stone dead. It was just glass, you know, and I wasn't going to lose my only joke. And I said, Master Hancock, a word in your ear. And he said, what? I said, a word in your ear. And I whispered the line. Oh, yes, he said, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, wonderful, yes, yes. And afterwards he said, I'm never going to do a show without you, never. He said, <laughs> and he went and prompt me live on television, he's, he's, he's in. And he was very generous. I did 13 shows on the trot. I'd never had my name in the papers. I mean, I'd, I didn't know what was to come, you know, the, the awful pillaging by the media, which happens, and those idiot questions. How, how you going, Alf? Warren, yeah, we know that, Alf, but I mean... Um, <laughs> Your producer just said you're on, Alf. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why he's my producer. Yeah. But what about the, going back to play again? Because the play's all about the theatre. Oh, yes. And it's I'm all about wondered. theatrical I'm... traditions. And it's yeah. all about something there that you mm. raised as well, with the Hancock thing, which is the kind of anxiety and the neurosis that all actors must have about either drying on stage or, or missing a curtain call. There's a moment, isn't there, in the, in the play where, in fact, this happens to, to Sir. The, yeah, the I mean, he's, uh, he's in a pretty awful state, the old actor who's... Um, 
whose knight it is, he has to get on to play King Lear, and he is in a catatonic state, near collapse, but I mean, the show must go on. And we don't know if he's ever going to get on, and I'm not going to tell you, you'll have to come and see the play to find out. But it is um, certainly the, the terror. I mean, no one can actually describe to anyone what it's like a first night. Um, you can't spit, you know, your mouth, and you get that terrible thing of the teeth get stuck on the upper lip like that. And your body doesn't seem to be connected to you at all. It doesn't obey you. You go to pick up a glass and you're six inches away from it. Eventually it settles down. It is... Uh, I forgot the point of what I was talking about. We were talking we'll about back to <clears throat> missing, missing <clears throat> cues, missing uh, entrances and that sort of thing. I was going to Well, I mean, the, the actor's nightmare is to appear stark naked and, and not know what the play is. I yeah. mean, that's... <laughs> that's has, that, has that ever happened to you? No, I mean, Gordon Chater's all right, because he has appeared stark naked in uh, <laughs> the elocution of Benjamin Franklin. Um, is my water your I'm sorry. It's all right. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it's, it's first night time. I missed my own glass by six inches and find, hit yours. Find the lady. Oh. Look, I've got a lump. Oh, it's meant to be like that. What is? I, I thought it was a chip out of the glass. It's actually... No, no, no. no. That's, that's, that's a very oh. expensive glassware. Nothing cheap and tacky about this show at all. <clears throat> I find... It's difficult to talk about the theatre for me. I'm a bit of a sentimental, emotional slob about it. I love it. I love the magic of the theatre. I don't like all this, you know, opening up the stage door and letting the public come in backstage. I think there are secrets, and we want to keep those secrets. I was doing a film with the Monty Python crowd. It was a film called Jabberwocky. And, I mean, suddenly there's a film unit filming us filming. And I don't want that. I mean, I want the... I want to be able to swear and shout and curse at people and, and make mistakes privately and present, eventually, the performance that I've worked on. When I was at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, um, we received the, uh, the graduate's counsellor and keepsake from Sir Kenneth Barnes, and it said, you do not go outside the stage door in your makeup, and I think that's right. Now, the variety side, I mean, comics always used to go to the pub in their makeup, you know, was a, but actors, I don't like that, and I don't... I'd like to break down some of the shibboleths about theatre. I mean, I don't... I mean, I don't like the audiences that go to the theatre. Mostly, they're too well dressed and too bloody rich. And um, I mean, if you're doing a well, if you're doing a, a revolutionary play, I mean, who are you preaching to? They're all these sort of, you know, enhanced at theatre clubs. They're all the intellectuals sitting there. And it's the same at the Nimrod here. You're preaching to the converted. I would like to see sweatshirts and thongs to be <laughs> de rigueur in the theatre because I mean, it's difficult to get those people. I mean, I had an experience in London again, trying to take culture to the masses when I was doing Death of a Salesman. I was working in my garden relaying these paving stones, and there was a stonemason working in the next, next house, and he looked over the fence, he said, Oh, Alf, you know, uh, you know, got to get them stones running away, mate, get the water running off. And he said, Do you want to hire my stone cutter? Because I'll let you have it half price. And he did, it was a big stone cutter, and I thought, well, that's very nice. And I said, Would you like to come and see Death of a Salesman? This wonderful production at the National Theatre. Oh, yes, yeah. said, Bring me missus. And he came along with a smart suit and all that, and with a missus, she was all dolled up to the nines. And uh, afterwards, we sat in a bar, and I waited ten minutes for him to say something about the play or my performance. Nothing. And about ten minutes later, he said, "Be hard on a bum, innit? <laughs> <laughs> and that was his sole comment on this great <laughs> masterpiece. This great masterpiece yeah. scene. So, I mean, you, so, it's difficult, you see. The, uh, the theatre is... A, uh, it has a minority appeal. It's like jazz. I mean, very, you, you can go on the campaign and say, we've got to bring jazz to the masses, you know, and very well-meaning and, and well-intentioned people do try, but the fact is it's a minority appeal. And I would say that in this country or in, in Britain, there's probably 90% of the population have never been to a live theatre and seen a live show. Yeah. Uh, I would like to drag in more of that, that But then it depends how you define theatre, because, I mean, you're a one-man show with Alf. That's theatre. I mean, that's not, a, that's not a cabaret act. No. I mean, it's theatre, isn't it? Well, uh, it's a sort of, I suppose, I, I like... I mean, I did it last night. The, the Ch Chairman Alf, that is. I haven't done the other for a long time now. But, um, <laughs> I did the thoughts of Chairman Alf at the... At Slow the... audience out there, they really are. I don't care, they can please themselves. You don't find it funny, sod you, I don't care. <laughs> um, I, no, I did the thoughts of Chairman Alf at the Miranda RSL. You know, it was uh, extraordinary because it is a theatre piece. And, I mean, I had a bit of trouble with the room going off to the pokies. I had to say, you know, shut that bleeding door while I'm talking. You know, a bit of Alf loutishness. And, um, but they listened and they were very attentive. And the end of the piece is some of Johnny Spate's best and most abrasive writing, political writing. 
They were very attentive and, and uh, an enormous reaction at the end. Get off, you pommy bastard! <laughs> <laughs> well, that's where I'll say to you more politely, but we'll be back in a moment to talk some more to Warren Mitchell. We'll now take this break. <laughs> Welcome back. Still to come on the show, Jack Jones and Australia's greatest journalist, Norman Gunston. But before that, my guest is Warren Mitchell. Warren, we're talking there about, about ALF, um, and you were talking about theatre and about involving people. The identification, I've seen you work on stage, of the audience to ALF is, is at total and absolute. I mean, he is a real live character, and they react to him and respond to him that way. What's the worst moment that you've had that's, that's happened on stage because they actually believe that you were this, this bigot up there? Yeah, I was doing the thoughts of Chairman Alf at the Grand Theatre Swansea, you see. And Alf does a bit in the act when he uh, is talking about women's lib, what about your man's lib? And uh, our, a man, having spent all that money training up that wife of his, I mean, he should have the same prerogative as your big football clubs to... <laughs> and be able to transfer her, you see. And, uh, <laughs> put her up on a transfer market. It's a bit of Johnny Spate's amazing, mad, you know, male chauvinist piggery, but the super stuff. And I do a bit when I, I chat up with people in the audience and I say, you know, if you, hypertheoretically, so if you was like <laughs> bored of your wife and you want to put her up for transfer, and some woman leapt up and said, nobody's going to transfer me, no bloody man owns me. <laughs> and I, I looked down and I said, well, looking at you, darling, I bloody understand why. <laughs> and, and this bloke leapt to his feet and said, you're dirty rotten. Well, I can't say the words because I'd be bleeped out, but. <laughs> He leapt to his feet, he tore down the aisle, leapt on the stage, thumped me, turned all the table over the props, and because everybody thought it was part of the show and they're all <laughs> laughing and so And I had to weigh up in my mind, I mean, I had to be in character. And Alf is an arrant coward, so I squared up to him from about 10, 12 feet away, you know. At uh, the same time, he was smaller than me. I could have actually hit him back. And I wanted to, but I didn't. Eventually, the audience tumbled with all these kind of Swansea second row forwards there, you know. So. Get out of here, stupid bastard. Go on, go on. <laughs> and uh, I think that was... That had been an awful... I mean, there was one night doing cabaret um, when uh, the spot operator... I shan't mention the club it was in. I was uh, doing my alphabet. It, was a, it wasn't the thoughts, it was my cabaret act. And the bloke on the spot came on the floor. He said, you know, the moving spot follows you around. And he said, hey, Alf, don't move for the next five minutes. I've got to go and take a piss. <laughs> 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 you mentioned there Johnny Spate. Sorry, I didn't mean to say that. No. <laughs> you mentioned there Johnny Spate. Now, um, I mean, Johnny just didn't create this character and forget it and, and hand it over to other people. No. I mean, he's lived with it and it's very important to, to John. How paternal is he about Alf? About, oh. He's very protective and possessive about it. And uh, I, I mean, he's seen my cabaret act and he said, I, I, I don't like it when you do all them jokes. He said, it's not what, what, what I wrote. <laughs> he got this terrible start. You know? <laughs> I mean, they, they, there's a story uh, about Johnny, because he collects caged birds. He's got minor birds and parrots and things. You ring up his home and you're talking to him and you hear in the background, Connie! Connie! <laughs> his wife's name is Connie, but this minor bird has heard him yelling to his wife so often and it, it now imitates him. Connie! <laughs> and he's got budgies and things. And the story is, um, he went into Harrod's pet store and he saw this beautiful parrot and he's heard... Hey, hey, how much is that lovely parrot? And the assistant said, 850 pints, sir. And he said, oh, I said, that's a lot of money for a parrot. <laughs> uh, can he talk? And the parrot said, a bloody sight better than you, mate. <laughs> I mean, Johnny started... Johnny's been analysed into the ground by all the social commentators about this amazing writer and, and is the racialism of Alf, is it destructive, is it productive, it, it, you know. And Johnny said, well, like Gary said, you know, he said, I just sit down to write a funny show. But still and all, he's very... He's very particular about the kind of comedy that he presents. There aren't jokes and it comes out... I mean, to, to Johnny, the funniest thing in the world is a working-class Tory. I mean, I, I, I think one of the best lines he ever wrote for Alf was, my granddad borrowed a pair of boots to walk 14 miles to vote Tory. <laughs> I think that's an extraordinarily uh, illuminating remark. Yeah. And I think, I mean, he writes about the things that he knows about. I mean, he, um, I, I can tell you that he collapsed. We, we've just done another series, yes. Till Death, back home, and he collapsed after writing five episodes. 
due to, you know, too much of that. Carted off to hospital, we didn't think we'd see him again. We did, he's a resilient bloke, he came out and wrote an episode, all, it all happens to Alf. I mean, Alf is, collapses one night and the, the doctor said, you know, and, and, and mum says, you know, shall I fetch the doctor? And Alf says, I mean, how's this for a bloke that's had a drink problem? And Alf says, no, no, he said, I, I, I don't want a doctor. It's just a drink, that's all. Yeah. And mum says, oh, it's just a drink, is it? She says, well, if I bought a pound of sausages and gave them to you for your breakfast, and after you'd eaten them, you started banging into the furniture and your speech got all slurred and you were sweating and you looked sick like you do now, I'd go back to that butcher and I'd say, you sold me some rotten sausages. And if he went on selling them, they'd lock him up. But just because it comes out of a bottle, you say it's just a drink, that's all. <laughs> that's the dilemma of uh, this thing which is advertised, which is, I mean, you know, when I first came to Australia playing this piss pot elf, I was expected, you know, to be able to drink like him, and I, I can't, I can drink one, but I mean, I go sailing a lot and play tennis, and they would expect me to, to stand my shout and to drink my shout, you know, 12 or 13 middies, and I can't do it. And I, in the end, I had to plead. I'd say, look, I'm, uh, I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> what? I'm uh, AA. Ah, oh, Jesus, Alf, that's all right, mate. Give him an orange juice. Ah, yeah. <laughs> now, I, I was one of the lads, because I'd been to the brink yes. to the, of the abyss, yes. you see, but uh, it, it really is an amazing... And people boast in this country, Jesus, did we get rotten last Wednesday, you know. <laughs> it is a, a source of pride to a lot of people, and uh, it's poison. Well, let's talk a bit about you in Australia, because you've been here, what, 15 years now, have you not been coming here? Yes. More than 15 years. And in many senses, of course, it's been very good to you, Australia, hasn't it? Because now uh, this, it was here that you, you did the, all the, the marvellous stuff that you took back to, to England. Well, I tried it out on the convicts first, you oh, see, and I thought, it, <laughs> thought if it went here. Well, I, I certainly, uh, I haven't done King Lear in Britain, but it was my, I don't know, I wanted to... Well, uh, Gary was unfortunate, I think, and I think the theatre here is very short-sighted if they don't grab at that amazing talent and give him good parts in plays. This may sound like I'm brown-nosing a bit, but it's, uh, I, I've seen Mr. MacDonald work and I can see a great artist. I mean, one of the things I can't stand about many actors, they're just a voice, you could put them on radio. I love to see a body which b becomes the character. I mean, I was outside the theatre in Townsville and uh, waiting to go in to see Gary MacDonald's show. I'd never seen him. And suddenly this lout starts to walk towards me. I mean, he looked about six foot three wearing this awful grey flannel suit with red piping down the epaulets and this amazing hair and moustache. Because I get these drunks come out to me all the time, you know. Hey, down, Alf, you know, all that bit. And then this guy comes out and says, Hello! I know who you are. And I said, Yeah, and I know you. You're, you're, you're the best dressed man in Townsville. <laughs> and just humour him, you know. And he said, We're going to be on the Parkinson show together. And I thought, This man's mad. <laughs> And everybody else was laughing. It was Gary. This was totally credible character. Outside the theatre, not even on the stage. So if they don't grab him, they're, they're, they're mad. I've not been... I've been lucky. I mean, I have been playing Alf, but when I said to the Queensland Theatre Company I'd like to play King Lear, only a few people laughed. Um, and they let me do it. But did you find it, did you find it easier to break away from the Alf Garnet thing here than you did in Britain? Well, certainly the critics at home are somewhat more daunting. And I suppose... If one is honest, uh, England is a unique place, as Britain is a unique place as far as the theatre is concerned, as far as television is concerned. Uh, it is a... there is a great deal of excellence. This is a... there are many reasons why the theatre is not so uh, well endowed here. It's, a, it's such a great country to live in. I mean, if you live in Oldham or somewhere else, you know, you need the repertory to go to every week. You need the theatre to escape from the grim realities of a North Country or Midlands industrial town. You know, if you live at Coogee, mate, and you finish work and you go and, you go and sit round somebody's pool and crack a few tinnies, and who needs to go to the theatre? So it doesn't flourish quite so well here. Um, well, it wasn't quite what I asked you. I know, it never asked, is. What I asked you, <laughs> no, what I asked you was, was that, that, that here it seemed to me that at least they said, there's a theatre, give him a go. Whereas in England, they didn't say that at all. We were more locked into, into the, the, the Garnet image there than... I than think, here. yes, I think, there's, I think the theatre is... I used to get plays sent to me after three or four other actors had turned them down. Right. I mean, I did do West End plays, but they're all flops. And, I mean, I had fun doing them, but they weren't... Um, they weren't the best scripts, because I was thought of as Alf, and they thought, well, it'd be a good name to have on the bill. Um, certainly, 
Death of the Salesman, which I started off doing at the Perth Playhouse with the West Australian National Company. And I went back and coincidentally found that, that my great mate, Michael Rudman, was going to direct it at the National. And I said, well, give us, a, give us a go, mate. And he let me read for it, and I got it. And, of course, I'm very grateful to... Well, I'm very grateful to the Australian Theatre, letting me flex my acting muscles out. Here. Yes. I don't know why I come out here all the time. I just have such a ball. I have a great time. It's a grim... I find Britain a bit grim at the moment, and there's not a lot of fun. And over here, well, there's, apart from the obvious things like the weather and the food, I, I, I like the people. I mean, there is a, there's an element of... Australians can't see themselves, but there is an element of real democracy in that Jack is as good as his master, and, you know, you can have all the strikes and all the confrontations. It doesn't really affect it. It's such a wealthy country. I mean, the hostess could go and strike for another six months, and people would probably realise that they don't need to travel. I mean, Gary MacDonald could go out, you know, travel around Sydney on a bus. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> he wouldn't buy that very much. But the minute we've got remaining, uh, Warren, what about the, this play, um, the dress then? You open when? We the... open on May the 22nd. Tremble, tremble, tremble <clears throat> in the guts. Well. I think it's a magnificent play. I've saw it six times in London. It is about the theatre and actors. The, you know, actors are mad characters, mad people. I mean, the, the, what drives us on to do it? And it is, for most people, Unemployment, and if it's not unemployment, it's touring. This play is set in 1942, and the Blitz is on. And I mean, it, but shows did go on, theatres did keep open. I remember myself, I was 13 years old when the Blitz started in London. I was in the intimate theatre, Palmer's Green, watching Barclay Square, John Clements, Saturday afternoon. And John Clements came out and did the speech, which is almost the speech that I do in the play. And John Clements came and said, Ladies and gentlemen, the early warning has just sounded. Will those of you who wish to live, um, excuse me, will, you, will those of you who wish to leave kindly do so? Uh, we shall proceed with the performance. Actually, that's the speech in the play. He didn't say, he didn't make the fluff, which Norman makes. But he said, you know, and the bombs are going off, the guns, and nobody moved. I just held my mum's hand a bit harder. And we watched Barclay Square while the Blitz was going on. This is really what the play is about. The right. show has got to go on. Right. Well, and we'll so have the commercials, so I suppose we'll have to take a break <laughs> now. <laughs> very much, in, in fact, look forward to seeing that. Um, in a moment, I'll be talking to Jack Jones, who'll also be singing as only he can. We'll see you in a minute, but Warren Mitchell for the moment. Thank you very much indeed. Warren Mitchell. <laughs> Welcome back. Now, my next guest is one of the supreme stylists of modern popular singing. When Frank Sinatra was asked to name his successor, he simply said, Jack Jones. And I, along with millions of others throughout the world, would not disagree with that. In an era where much of popular music is a confusion of new sounds and styles, he continues that great tradition found by male vocalists like Sinatra, Crosby and Tony Bennett. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Jack Jones. <laughs> Well, hello there, friend of mine You've been reaching for yourself For such a long time There's so much to say No need to explain Just an open door Coming from the rain From the rain It's a long road When you're on your own And someone like you Is bound to take the long way home There's no right or wrong No one's to blame I just want to be the one To keep you from the rain From the rain Has left us older and wiser. I know I am. And it's good to know that my friend has come. 
come home again And I think of us Like an old cliche But it doesn't matter Cause I love you Bit of singing. Nice, nice, that. Very good Very indeed. Very good indeed. You've just nice. been, in fact, to South Africa, haven't you? Yes, you I have. That. And I must say, first, that it's nice to be back here. Uh -huh. I, uh, I did so well the last time I was here. They, they said, uh, "Do you have any open time 12 years from now?" <laughs> and I said, "Yeah, here I am." <laughs> 12 years. It's been 12 years. Yeah. Has it really? Yeah, really. What took you so long to get over here? I don't know. Huh? But I was uh, looking forward to it. Yes, I was in South Africa, and that was a new experience for me because I'd never been there. Mm -hmm. What kind of uh, gig were you working there? It wasn't in South Africa as such, was it? It was a. It's the they call it Southern Africa. It's a it's a different country, but it's only 130 miles or so outside of Johannesburg, and uh, it's quite interesting. It's uh, called uh, Popotswana, and there's a big um, hotel and gambling complex and golf course and tennis courts and uh, a lake and uh, whatever you want is there, and it's it's called Sun City. Did you play to multiracial audiences there? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. Bob, you wouldn't let him in to my country if they did not play to multiracial. <laughs> <laughs> we don't like that kind of thing in my country. But I mean, if you go out there to South Africa, no matter what sort of place you go to in South Africa, you're in fact in danger of being blacklisted nowadays, aren't you? I mean, well, when I got whitelisted in my case. But <laughs> Will you, just, will you just shut up I'm for a so moment? I'm so sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Jones, concentrate on me entirely. All right. We'll see more. Okay. Right. Got, uh, no notice of these people. <laughs> <laughs> what about the, the uh, blacklisting, though? I mean, have you been threatened with it or what? I got off the plane and uh, they had the normal press conference, you know, when you get off the plane and your eyes are crossed because you've got jet lag and you, you sit down and there are cameras rolling and whatever. And they said, uh, well, Mr. Jones, how do you feel now that you're going to be blacklisted all over the world? And I said, what? You know, and uh, they said, yes, that's what's going to happen to you for playing here. And I said, well, I didn't know that. And uh, uh, they are trying to do it with the sports figures, and now they're trying to do it with entertainers. And I don't think it's going to work, but uh, uh, I was playing in a place that uh, was no different than wherever I play uh, elsewhere, and I didn't notice any difference. Uh, yeah. You, nice I mean, you though. wouldn't go over there, would you, Warren? No. No, I've been asked to go. I couldn't go and do ALF because ALF is such a racialist. I mean, they'd agree. They wouldn't see the funny side of it. They'd just <laughs> agree, you know. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, because... No, I wouldn't go. I, I, I mean, the theatre is about all peoples and all races and all it's creeds. You're playing mm -hmm. to a multiracial audience out there. Well, I mean, it isn't you... possible. It isn't possible well, to play. Well, it's not play. impossible. It's just played. It oh, is, there. I'm, I'm not knocking was, Jack. Yeah. No, no, yeah. where you're where it's fine. Yeah. I wouldn't go to South Africa. There's a great deal of money to be earned. But I think the only way in which we can, without a war, and no sensible person wants to start dropping bombs on South Africa, the only way we can change things is by this kind of action. I know that the, there are actors, uh, very serious-minded people, who believe that by going there, by contacts with South Africa, we can change things. I think that ostracizing them is probably a more effective But way. there's also mm. a great deal, well, I think that Jack would agree with that in a, in a sense, but I mean, I, I, I think that there's a great deal of hypocrisy involved as well. There certainly um, is. Take the cricket as an example. I mean, take this last tour of, of West Indies by, by England, I and mean, we go to Guyana and we're kicked out of there. Well, that's one thing, but there's several Guyanese playing cricket in England working and earning a living alongside South, South African cricketers. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, that's a, I think it's, that's oh, a, a, a uh, total I mean, hypocrisy. Everywhere. I mean, I played in Alice Springs at the Riverside Tavern, which is right in the middle of, you know, Aboriginal settlements all around. There were no Aboriginals in the audience. Uh, I, I don't think they were barred, but they weren't made very welcome. You know, this country, everywhere. I mean, Britain today, let's face it, it's a racial maelstrom. I didn't, I didn't go years ago. I was asked to go. Uh, and my main reason at that time was that I had someone working for me who, who was black. Mm -hmm. 
and I did not want to put that person through uh, going, you live over here and you can't be with us anymore right. for the duration of the, of, the, of the, except on stage. So that was my reason. All I knew was I was going and I was going to work at this place, which is different than the, uh, the philosophy that, uh, that uh, Johannesburg has and has right. had for years. That's it. Sinatra's going in July, and uh, I think once he goes, uh, I think that it may be more recognized as uh, a multiracial situation. Talking about Sinatra, do you ever get sick of that, that quote of his? Being... Well, I heard your introduction. It's awfully tough to follow that. Why? Well, well, he, uh, he said it. He, he said it, but uh, the son of a gun uh, won't quit, see? So how's he, how are you going to be a successor <laughs> if the guy doesn't quit? <laughs> He's going now, what, he's 65 now, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you, will you be singing popular love songs at, at his age, do you think? Would you want to? I think that if, uh, you know, if I'm lucky enough to be asked to sing at 65, I probably will. Mm -hmm. there, are not, there are not too many people that are uh, in, the, in, in the romantic singing category the, uh, or the matinee idol that are asked to do that. Uh, someone uh, such as uh, Warren, who is a wonderful actor, and can play many parts, can go on and on and on, you know. Well, That's I'm only waiting until I am 65. I mean, Alf is 65. <laughs> I started playing Alf when I was 42. I'm now 55. I've only got another 10 years to go, and I won't have to put on the makeup. <laughs> <laughs> but what about, was it inevitable that you would be a singer? Because, I mean, your dad was a singer, wasn't there? There was music in the family. Yeah, I think so. I always wanted to be a singer and an actor, and I never, uh, I never really thought about doing anything else. Mm. But I was exposed to that environment all my life, so. You, you worked, in fact, with your father, didn't you? That's how I started mm -hmm. in uh, 1957 in Las Vegas at uh, the Thunderbird Hotel, which is now the Silverbird Hotel. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a brief, uh, just a trial. He, he wanted me to see if I really liked it, if I really wanted to go on with it, which I did. And, I, and he very generously gave me, uh, paid me $750 a week. Gee. Uh, starting out in the business, that's pretty good. Uh, and... My father gave me sixpence. All right. <laughs> nice to keep away from him. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and then the next job I had was in a bo in a little club in a bowling alley for for a hundred bucks a week, uh, and uh, it was interesting because I could hear while I was singing, I could hear the the balls hitting the uh, the pins. You know. What oh. you you did a, an entire sort of. Um... Uh, experience of that, didn't you? Playing clubs and, and that sort of thing. What kind of dives did you get into? Oh, all kinds. Uh, every kind of club. Have you done the Marrick Valaris L Club? Yeah. <laughs> the what? The Marrick Valaris L Club. It is not to be missed. No. <laughs> you have to. Uh... <laughs> Is that where they eat performers, though, do they? They, uh, they eat me. Do they? You know, <laughs> I said, if you don't shut up, I'm gonna. Leave the stage. Piss off, you bull-headed pommy bastard. That's it. <laughs> you ought to go there, Jack. Actually, they like you. They, 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 they like singers. Really? Um, what's his name? Uh, Green Door. You know, Frankie Vaughan. He well, goes very big there. Um, <laughs> he's hardly like Frankie Vaughan, is he? No, he's not like Frankie Vaughan. No. No, no. Nobody's like Frankie Vaughan. <laughs> <laughs> Just as well. Going back to this... Even Kamal isn't like Frankie Vaughan. <laughs> Going back to these, these, these clubs and things, I mean, what kind of... Uh, of um, instruments and things that you encounter? Because I remember Oscar Peterson telling me once about the clubs he played and the pianos he expected to play. Well, you know, the, the, there's a whole outlook on, on, on showbiz in, in those clubs, like uh, there's a club called the 802 Club in Brooklyn. There were, in, around the New York area when I was starting, unfortunately there aren't the, the, those places aren't there to play anymore for young performers. Uh, but there were a lot of clubs around the New York area and it was a good uh, weekend to pick up money, you know. And one of them was the 802 Club, but the, the dressing rooms were terrible, and uh, that's to be expected. But you're trying to make music, and the pianos were just terrible. And I went up to this one club owner, and I said, excuse me, but I can't work with this piano. It's awful. And he says, what do you mean? I said, the piano, it's terrible. It's just the worst. He says, what do you mean? I just had it painted. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the... But to him, it made sense, right? And you tell this story the other I night. I told it the other night, the and Jim George's. McDonald, who brought me over here this trip, um, I didn't know it was him. So I, I and I was, I just got up from a nap, and I was, I didn't know if I was going to make it on stage. And the friend was having jet lag and not much time to recuperate. And so I, I come to work last night, and there's a sign on the piano. It says wet paint. <laughs> <laughs> nice one. Yeah. yeah. You enjoying it there, the St. George's? Yes, we've been there um, two nights, and. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's still an audience there. The people there. who are watching you right now are not there. 
the people who are watching yeah, that's, that's right. true. The that's people who are watching us are not watching me yes. at the Cronulla Southern and Leeds Club. That's right. Where I am at this moment <laughs> this while they're watching me. It's very... <laughs> it's, I'll tell you, it's true. <laughs> I tell you, it's a true story. Eric Morecambe, you know the one with the glasses. You, you know Morecambe and Wise. Well. And Eric Morecambe was sitting at home watching television with his son. His son was about five. And his son was looking at the screen, seeing his dad, looking at his dad next to him, and he suddenly said, Are you doing it now, Dad? <laughs> <laughs> it's just confusing, isn't it? Yeah. What about, uh, what about the, the songs that you've seen? You said uh, you're you in this sort of tradition of, of singing these uh, great romantic ballads. Is it more difficult nowadays to get uh, material? good songs than it, than it was, say, in the, the great era of, of the romantic uh, music? Well, it's more difficult because the, the, uh, the writers uh, of today are singing them themselves and, uh, yeah, and keeping right. them for themselves, and they're not uh, flooding the market with songs, except for, uh, like, Peter Allen. I've done about four or five of his songs. Uh, the last one I did was a thing called Don't Wish Too Hard that he wrote with Carol Bayer Sager. Now, there's a wonderful lyricist, you see. Yeah. Those are the Sammy Kahn's uh, and Jimmy Van Heusen's of today. Um, but yes, it is, it's tough. Uh, Jack, do you ever get the feeling, I mean, like actors, there are actors and directors, and Jonathan Miller's one, who won't direct new plays, because he said there's enough great old plays. And I have that feeling, I mean, I, I'm a jazz fan, so perhaps I go, and also I'm old enough to remember the Cole Porter. And the, mm -hmm. But I mean, do you, do you ever wonder why there's any necessity to write new songs, because there are so many and great lyrics of the old song. I mean, that's really what's missing. Mm. I always think that those, you know, ladies are tramp, things like that. Amazing words. Well, yes, they are, but, but, but the world changes and, uh, and people have different ways of saying the same thing. Mm. Different ways of saying, I love you. And, it, and it's a little bit more subtle nowadays. Well, I love you, yeah, 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 yeah. I love you, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, With a love like that, it can't be bad. I mean, <laughs> bloody how, rubbish, isn't how it? About shake, how, so, about, how about shake your groove thing, yeah, yeah. Shake your what thing? Groove, groove thing. thing, yeah, yeah. Disgusting. But I mean, no, <laughs> we're Listen not this. talking about those songs. We're talking about love songs, and there are wonderful love songs written. The one I just uh, That's sang nice was, song, was yeah. by... Uh, uh, now, I'm just, I've, her name is gone, but she's a good friend of mine. Um, Melissa Manchester yeah. and Carol Blair Sager. Uh, anyway, there are wonderful songs being written, but times change. You must keep changing with them and keep writing new songs. Well, the the, the show that you're doing. Sure, sure, right. Did you, did the you show have... that you're doing at St George is a blend of the old no blend, yeah. and, uh, and the new. You're now going to sing for for us, for me actually, because I did ask you to to sing this uh, a marvelous old love song, so standard. Yeah, I love this song yeah, too. It's called Come Rain, Come Shine. All right, I'll all right. Sing it. Sing right now. Oh. Like nobody's loved you Come rain or come shine High as a mountain Deep as a river Come rain or come shine I guess when you met me It was just one of those things
My final guest tonight has made a very singular contribution to the world of journalism. His fearless, tough questioning has set new standards in television interviewing, leaving its wake a trail of mangled, bemused victims. It can truly be said of him, and often has, that he is to the art of television and interviewing what Danny LaRue is to rugby league. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Norman Gunston. Fair suck at a Yorkshire pudding, you don't. You don't expect me to sit down. Sorry, do you want to my seat? Oh, no, no, please. There's only one man in the uh, whole world who can fill that seat. Oh. It isn't currently on tour at the moment. <laughs> He's all singing, all dancing, idiot tantalising, can't stop the guns and stage show that has played in every civilised part of Australia and is now coming to Melbourne. <laughs> uh, well, I'm not. Wait a minute, I'm the last person. Look, I'm the, I'm the most important guest. I'm the last person on the show. Yes, and, like, then you've got me sitting here. I'm not having those two guys sitting behind me and pulling faces at the camera all the way through my interview. All right. <laughs> I, you know, that's an old trick, that. You would sit there. I've used it myself a couple of times. <laughs> you don't sit there. No, no, come on. Sit there. No, <laughs> don't, make, don't make him move. No. Don't make, I ask you not to make him, not to have me follow Mr. the Reverend Jack Jones. <laughs> 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 well, look what happened to those 900 followers of his in Guyana. <laughs> well, boys, them. Some people do anything to get on. That's incredible. <laughs> move, move that, okay. Move, 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 move. Go on, go on. Go on, you've had your... No, no, you... Oh, that's it, that's right. Go on, go on. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, <clears throat> so obviously always a bit of slight nervousness when uh, one is confronted with the greatest interviewer in the English-speaking world. <laughs> but just relax, take a deep breath, I won't bite you. <laughs> <laughs> ten minutes, he's given me ten minutes. It's barely enough time for a couple of uh, self-effacing anecdotes, a few uh, shock, personal, intimate revelations, and a few brief words on why I picked American Express in the first place. <laughs> ten minutes. <laughs> so, uh, uh, am I interviewing you or are you interviewing me? Yeah, you? go for it, go for it. All oh, right. <laughs> I'd like to, first of all, what you got that gear on for? Because I love cricket, Mr. Parkinson. Oh, I love it. I love it. Love it. Great game. You know, like Mr. Jack Fingleton does, you know, that you had on your last series yes. and he took over the whole show. That's and true. You invited him back on again. <laughs> I'm not stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be on the program and it goes midweek. <laughs> yeah, well, <clears throat> well yeah, it's just a great story. You'll love it. It's a great anecdote. It's really funny. Hilarious. Uh, this is about, uh, you know, the, uh, the only uh, Wollongong uh, cricketer that ever played in a uh, <laughs> test team. You know. Well, you know immediately who I'm talking about, don't you? No. Yeah, yeah, come on. I don't know. Dr. W.O.G. Grace. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, he probably... Oh, yeah, yeah, you know his nickname, Don't you know? know what? Uzo. <laughs> the world's most famous Greek leg opener. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you remember? You remember? You remember? You remember how he used to start his... Remember how he used to start his back, uh, back swing uh, through the gully and then roll his wrist on a pull shot through a deep mid-wicket? Especially off long hops and googlies. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, anyway. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, anyway Wollongong come out, Wollongong come out to, you know, playing. They're playing the, uh, the touring English uh, test team, right? Uh, uh, down at Kamal Oval, you know? And, uh, yeah, oh, no, well, you know, that's just, uh, no, that's just what we call it, you know, because of the pitch, you know. It's, it's flat at both ends. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, and a bit rough in the middle, you know? Anyway. Anyway, there's a lot of ill feeling. There's a lot of ill feeling toward the Poms because of, you know, because of Mr. Jeff Boycott. I mean, like, you know, hey. he says, well, he says he's, he says he's, 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 he agrees with it. You know, like, he's not, like, you know, about South Africa and everything, but, you know, he's the only person I know who's gone to see Breaker Morant and Barracks for the Boers all the way through. <laughs> so, anyway, like... Right, uh, you know, that now the, the, the English, they're, they're caught on a, a sticky wicket, right? right? Yeah, you know, like, uh, I mean, it hasn't rained for weeks, but the groundsman is a Lebanese. And, well, <laughs> yeah. 
It's more of a greasy wicket, actually. Anyway, <laughs> we've, got, we've, we've got our left arm spinner on, you know, and the Poms can't pick the Chinaman, you know? Because uh, he's actually a Vietnamese boat person. I mean, he's <laughs> right, so Ian Botham, the test, uh, English test captain, he, he goes for a big hit right into the press box, you know? And then he comes out to bat, right? Now, I uh, like... Um, no, you'll love this. You'll love this. This is great. This is great. This is hilarious. You'll love this. First ball, right? First ball hits him right on the pads. Dr. W. Joe G. Grace yells, How's that? But the, uh, the, the umpire is a Turk. He takes one look and says, LBW. <laughs> <laughs> Done that one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, well, oh. it's well, a lot of the a lot of the humour of that anecdote <laughs> would go over the heads. Well, it? you've got to understand what LBW means in Turkish. You know? <laughs> 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 oh, yeah. Listen, what? What? <laughs> I must ask you, as, as as a great interviewer, yeah. which is what you are. Sure, you got bad breath or something? <laughs> 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 what? What kind of, uh, of technique do you use when interviewing? Is there any secret to anything? I always dress correctly and try and write up a neat resume, you know, yes. and uh, sort of things like that. Look, you know, have a crease in my trousers, you know, before I put them on, you know, yes. and, uh, you know, shoes on after socks, that sort of thing. You yes. know? Well, what do you think was, has been your best interview? Because you've interviewed some of the greats in the world, mm. haven't you? Yeah. Well, that's a pretty easy one. Harry Lazarus. <laughs> yeah, the, the employment officer at Channel WOG4. <laughs> and Arnie Pat's de facto. Oh. That's my Arnie Pat. Uh, he's her de facto. That's how I got my first job. A little bit of nepotism there, you know? You know, like, I mean, like, well, quite a bit of nepotism, actually. He, he actually put Arnie Pat on the screen, you know? She had Australia's first game show on television. It was called On The Game. <laughs> yeah. but, but it got axed, you know, because uh, it was rigged. All the winners were manipulated. Now, you're also... She was the one who had that fantastic catchphrase, you know, Come on down! <laughs> you've, you've also... You're very musical as well, I know that. Have yeah, you know that? Right. Who, who have been the musical influences on your life? Well, um, I might just take these pads off. Yeah, I'm if you want to get toxic shock of the kneecap or anything. <laughs> well, I, I, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mr. Don, Mr. Don Lane. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because like I mean, you know, no, because like especially for my dancing, Mr. Don Lane, you know, yeah, he's go he's God to me, you know, he, he moves in mysterious ways. So. <laughs> okay. um, Sa uh, Sammy Namanjira Jr. Uh, uh, you know, Wollongong's, yeah, what? Wollongong's, uh, uh, you know, part Jewish Aboriginal song and dance man. <laughs> he, he has sung more people to death than Demis Roussos. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty, pretty broad, broad taste musically. Well, you well know. sir, the sound of you come to the end of this spot, but we will return in a moment for you because you have a message to the Australian people I know that you wish to impart. Yeah. And I think as a man of letters, a Pulitzer Prize winner and journalist and all this sort of thing, you should be allowed that. Oh. Oh, so we'll return in just a moment for Mr Norman Gutz's message to the nation. See you in a moment. <laughs> We've reached the end of our, of our show tonight, but uh, before we go, as I mentioned, I'd like Mr Norman Gunston to address the nation. He has something of tremendous import to say. I'd just like to say that Australians have always believed in fair play. And all right, Mr Parkinson, he's just come to Commercial Channel. He hasn't quite got the commercial feel yet, and he keeps doing that to his nose all the time, which in Wollongong can get women pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> The show obviously will not, the show will not be sold to New Zealand because the Maoris are very sensitive, the nose is a sensitive organ there, and any man that walks around doing that to his own nose goes blind. <laughs> Half the Kiwis in Bondi are blind. <laughs> At least three nights a week. <laughs> but he is working hard, he has obviously been watching Mr Don Lane's technique, you can tell it by his snappy opening monotone. And it'll only be... <laughs> it'll only be a number of weeks, I'm sure, before he gets the whole thing down pat. Now... <clears throat> I think that you should give him, give him the, the credit to know that he will, he will handle it. It's like, I mean, you're going to have to have a lot of... The trouble is, you're not going to get the uh, interviewing guests that you've got on the ABC. You can't pick and choose here. You know, you've got to only interview Channel 10, like people that are employed by Mr Murdoch. Really? Yeah, it's like, you know, Bernard King and Jimmy Hannon, Miss McKenzie, Malcolm Fraser. <laughs> <laughs> it's not as easy, you know? <laughs> All I'm saying to you is, remember this. Australia is a great country. 
It is a great country and it must remain that way. It must remain free so that people from all other walks of life, other countries, other religions, other races, can come to Australia and leave again with happy memories when their tourist visas expire. <laughs> Thank you, Australia. Thank you, Mr. Guns. What a marvellous and stirring world. I'd like to thank uh, my guests for the night, Mr. Michael. <laughs> <laughs> it's an all habit, guys. <laughs> well, my thanks to Warren Mitchell, to Jack Jones, and to Gary McDonald, and Norman Gunston. <laughs> I'll be back at the same time next week, when my guests will include Jack Thompson, Dame Enid Lorimer, Rod Laver, and Eric Bull. We'll see you then. In the meantime, from all of us here, very good night. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>